Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 156 of the Board Game Barrage podcast. We are clean in the middle of our top 50 games of all time. This is part three. Three is the magic number. Three is the magic number. No movie series has ever not been improved in the third film. Universally across the board, everyone likes the third part best. Godfather 3, Back to the Future 3, Indiana Jones 3. All highlights of this series. Star Wars 3. Three tanks. Three tanks. <laughs> what? The threequel. Joining me in the studio today are my three fellow tanks. The red tank, Kellen. The blue tank, Christina. And the green tank, Mark. How are you all doing? I love our studio. This is a Yeah, studio. our communal virtual studio. It's really nice and cozy in here. Uh-huh. It reminds me of my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of atmosphere I try to recreate in our studio. You, you feel at home every time. Right. Everyone good? Yes. Kellen? I am very good. I got the text message that our studio is a coronavirus-free studio oh, earlier good. today. Congratulations. <laughs> and then I read a newspaper article saying the Los Angeles testing methodology is the worst in the country and was never intended to be used as it's being used. And that was the test that Kellen took. Okay, let's get right into our lists. We are doing numbers 30 to 21 this week. And let's just kick it off. We're going to be going in the order of MNCK. For those that have been following along, we're changing it up. Why changing it? What is this? Kellen, (laughs) no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Kellen, there is a method to this. We need to maintain the familiarity of the order, but mix it up with the offset. There's a process. M N C K. M N C K. Mark. This one this one seems good. I can do this one. You can do what? What one? This alphabet ordering. I'm okay with. <laughs> oh yeah. You're bad with <laughs> this... alphabetical, but you can handle M N C K. This makes more sense to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why. Because I'm in the lead. You're right behind me. And then uh Oh, no, you're not. No, no Kellen's I'm... last place in this oh, situation. Right. Oh, okay. No, no, no. If by last place you mean gets to speak last, then first is best, mm-hmm. and the worst is yet to come. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm going to start off with my number 30, which is a new entry to my list. And this is actually a game that, while I really like it, obviously, it's a hard game for me to recommend. I think it's not for everybody, and maybe you guys can tell me if you think it's for you, because we've played it a couple times now. This is Container. Container is the heavy economic game. It's a game of like incremental gains. You all own uh, shipping companies and you're managing uh, factories and warehouses trying to make the most money. It has one of my favorite things in board games, government subsidies. (laughs) So if you're looking for a game with government subsidies, Container definitely has that for you. I love the intricate connectivity of all the pieces in container and how it works like on an economic level but it is hard again to recommend it fully and wholeheartedly because it is such an incremental game you're trying to make a buck here and a buck there there are interesting aspects where you're trying to take maybe the lead in one of the aspects of the market you want to be like the person who produces the most or the person who has some sort of control over some aspect of the economic system that comes out of the game but it isn't necessarily some rollicking time it it is a very tough squeak out a couple bucks here and there where you can so yeah it's a game that i I really really like but again if you're into heavy economic games i think you've got to at least give it a shot but if you don't like economic games then probably something that you can you can pass on i will also say it's one of the weirdest games not only because of the systems that that it has i think it's unique in the gameplay but also it's got like these in a lot of the editions it's got these like huge resin boats that are like nice models not really super necessary for economic game, but they're nice. But then they've got like a clip art island in the middle where everybody's shipping their goods to, which is really odd. And it's just a game that is bizarre in a lot of ways, but charming, I would say. What do you guys think of Container? Negative, not for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Container is one of those games I, I admire more than I love because there's something about the emergent guardrail this experience of it where the whole system is sort of just at the player's whims you know the economy the way that every player sort of market evolves is entirely player driven in a way that can go off the rails and has both times i played container at least not my favorite but again one i definitely admire for being that emergent that wide yeah i was grateful to have played it again in the quarantine on tabletop simulator because it allowed me to move on from the 
17 pound jumbo edition <laughs> that I do have. It is a very interesting game and I think perfect for those who like it. I do not love how for you brown is worth 10 and for me brown is worth 2. And something about that combined with the like transparentness of the rest of the gameplay makes that part just to have a little bit too much like gotcha reveal at the end for me for some reason, but sure. very fascinating. And that is Container, my number 30 game, a new entry to the list. My number 30 game of all time is Azul. This is such a main... Elon! Hello. That's my number 30 game, too. Double crossover. <laughs> double crossover. <laughs> double crossover. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. And well-deserved. Azul is incredible, right? Right. Should we do the thing where you say a word and then I say a word to make a full sentence? So you say like Azul, I say (laughs) is. Of course. Why are you asking? Of course we should do this. (laughs) Okay. So, I mean, we're like so in tune on this, Christina. I feel like we can hash out our opinions on Azul like... Okay, ready? Tandem. Go Go for it. Azul. Is. The. Best. Game. (laughs) (laughs) Done! That. Oh. (laughs) Uh, that uses... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> tile. Oh, we didn't give them tiles. Laying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. I didn't think about the next word. <laughs> tile laying. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where I was going to. Yes, I agree. <laughs> and scene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think we've spoken up Azul a lot on this podcast. It is a... Very accessible puzzle game. The plastic tiles are fun to look at. They're fun to play with. They're so tactile. But like underneath the hood, there's like a mean drafting game there where you don't want to be the person that gets got with all the tiles at the end. Yeah, it's also, and we've talked about this in past episodes, but it's really, really good to teach people who are new to games. Absolutely. Uh, new to gaming because it's not too mean. Like it's definitely mean and it feels horrible and it's tense because you don't want, like Neilan said, you don't want to be the last one with all the trash stuff. But it's still like approachable enough. It's not too mean to where people are like, oh, this is cool. And it's obviously so beautiful that right. it's immediately something that people like to look at and touch and play around with. I feel like that's one of those things that I say a lot, but I can't be overstated. There's like a sound of the tiles clicking together. There's a feel. There's mm-hmm. a look. There's an aesthetic. Everything about it is such a beautiful presentation and production that it's very appealing to people that even have no interest in that sort of game i think that board game barrage as a podcast is probably of all the board game media people out there i think we care the most about like the way things feel yeah you know what i mean (laughs) yes (laughs) as the sexiest podcast is our duty (laughs) Nobody's talking about the sensuality of board games. That's the problem. (laughs) That's why we started Board Game Bra. Right. We wanted to bring you something that nobody was talking about. Uh So when you think of the sexuality of Azul, what does that mean? (laughs) I just want to rub it all over me at all times, basically, (laughs) is how I feel about Azul. And that's why it's our number 30 game of all time. And that's, that's our, our number, number 30, 30 game, game of, of all time, time Azul. Azul. <laughs> all right. My number 30 favorite board game of all time is down 13 positions that year. But let's still be excited about it because I'm still very excited about it. This is perhaps the most novel game on my entire list. This is Zendo. Zendo is a logic game that all other logic games aspire to be. One player is a master. They'll be creating a rule using beautiful translucent shapes, and others are trying to figure out what that rule is. A rule could be something like, a structure must contain exactly two pyramids, or the rule could be the structure could contain at least two pyramids. And so you have to sit there and wonder, how am I going to build buildings and then ask the master, does this follow the rule without others knowing? So that's what's really twisty about it is trying to not reveal what you already know. Everyone is watching. Every structure you make, you say, master, is this it? And then the master will go, no, that is not it until someone gets it right. But then, but then you actually have to know why is this right without revealing. And so there's been so many games of Zendo where I know what it is, I think, or I'm building structures that are right, but I'm not exactly sure. And then goddamn Neelan snipes it. 
because he can just evaluate the board because he's got the better logic than me, even though I'm the better builder. <laughs> Easy money. <laughs> Zendo, really, there is nothing like this. It is so cool, so interesting, so unique. I encourage everyone to play it. I think that's deceptively simple. More of an activity, I'll give you that, but a great one, Zendo. Yeah, I never really got into this one, and I'm not exactly sure what it was because the pieces are really pretty. They're translucent. Sexy, even. (laughs) But one of my problems is that Neelan's too good at it, and my second problem is that I'm very bad at deduction, and so I get really, really, really frustrated in this game, and I never end up having any fun. And fun is all that matters to me. I love this game, except I have no fun while I play it. No, I specifically said I don't like this game. Okay. I really like Zendo. I think it's probably my favorite deduction game. I think it's better like than Cryptid, for sure. I'd much rather play Zendo. I think it's better than Sleuth for me. The one problem I have playing it, and specifically when we play with Kellen, is he insists on going with the master rule, so we do have to address him as master whenever he builds something. <laughs> That's sort of just a suggestion in the book, uh-huh. but he, he demands that we stick to the rules uh, in that case. first for me. All deduction games should have to answer, is this better than Zendo? And none of them can, because it is truly the master. <laughs> It is cool. I'll give you that. That is Zendo, my number 30th favorite game of all time. My number 29 favorite game of all time has risen three spots. It was 32 last year and actually 26 the year before that. This is Age of Steam. I am looking at my yet unopened Age of Steam Deluxe Edition that we should play when we do Mark Con. Uh, we talked it about. Look? It looks deluxe. It looks very sensual. Wait, it's above Yeah, you? I feel like it's going to fall on your head the way you're looking. <laughs> It is above me, and it, is, it does weigh quite a bit. So, Is it towering over you? It is part of a tower. It's not towering over me. It's okay, not like... Mark is, for those who aren't video watching, because none of you are, Mark yeah. is looking straight up right now. Like his neck is craned. <laughs> his eyes are straight up to the ceiling. Uh, no, no, oh, no. my God. Oh, oh wow. Okay. It really is. That's a less precarious than I yeah. expected. But uh, still, when you said tower, you I was expecting like, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, a straight yeah, up stack. It's still tower. It's, it's, yeah. Artistic license. I took artistic license. <laughs> Anyhow. Age of Steam is sort of like the train game that fits between Cube Rail games and 18xx. So it doesn't have the stock manipulation that 18xx games have that make them a little complicated, but it's not as streamlined as a lot of Cube Rail games like Chicago Express and Irish Gage, where those are like very stripped down, very minimalistic. That's ru- a winsome game. That is a winsome game. I wrote that down so that I could sound train knowledgeable. <laughs> is I adjacent? You were right on target. Choo choo, mother. <laughs> Age of Steam is in the middle. It's got the stripped down rules of the Winsome slash Cubreal games, but it's a little more complicated, I would say, than those games in general. But it's got really, really tight decisions depending on the map you play, and there are hundreds of maps now. There's a lot of cutthroat actions you can take. It can be a very aggressive game depending on how you play it and the map you're playing it on. It's just a really nice fit between the super simple Cubreal and very complicated 18xx, but it's a really, really great system. It's tried and true. You know, There wouldn't be hundreds of maps if, if people didn't love it and, and for good reason. That is Age of Steam, my number 29 game of all time. My number 29 is Coloretto. This is probably the lightest, filleriest game on my entire list, but it is pure design simplicity in a small box. In my mind, this is the card game that should replace, like, uno as the family mainstay i know that there are more uno like games that have come into vogue especially in the last couple of years but for me colorado is still the one that i would pick it is a game of pressing your luck you're playing cards to multiple heaps not hops excuse Kellen. me <laughs> how dare you Neil? Wow. and at any point before those heaps fall, you can choose to take the cards in the what Kellen? is it just heaps? i don't even I, are you are, is, is, that this... a, is that a real word what heaps well, I know it's a real word, but is that... Oh, I thought it, this was the South African pronunciation of hot. <laughs> no. Anyway, you play cards to one of a few rows, and before those rows fill, you can elect to just sort of cash out and take one of the rows of cards. You're trying to set, collect cards, and that's almost the entirety of the game. It's a game of, do I keep pulling a card out to like make this row more exciting, or do I just take it before... It gets full of stuff that I, I don't want. And then it's just that. But the variants of the scoring are designed in a way that makes it not just purely about collecting the, as many of specific cards as possible. There's some more nuance to that. It's just so simple. It's one of those card games you can play on repeat 
endlessly and that you could take anywhere in its tiny box. Colorado is fantastic and it is my number 29 game of all time. My number 29 game of all time is going to blow your socks off (laughs) because it's new this year. This is the 2020 game and we... Well, I'm not sure if Mark has played this, but we collectively have and really enjoyed this game. This is Beyond the Sun. Any yeah, reactions? Fantastic. Game. <laughs> Look, here's a reaction. Ready? My socks got blown off. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Were you taking your socks off I suddenly, was. secretly, though? <laughs> This is a sexy podcast. <laughs> Mark is just <laughs> stripping while I'm describing, while I'm over here rambling. Wow. Oh my gosh, that's commitment. Yes, my number 29 game of all time is Beyond the Sun, which is a tech tree slash space civilization game in which you are researching technologies, you are colonizing systems, and there are various achievements and events that you're completing throughout the game. There are multiple ways to win this game. For example, you can commit to the colonizing systems game, and you take a specific route in technologies to help you along that route. There's like a science route where you're kind of uncovering these really crazy technologies that unlock different abilities. Each player is creating their own tech tree in every game, and there are different achievements in every game that kind of incentivizes you along different routes. But it's totally possible and happens where players will take completely different routes, and Kellen will take the military route and colonize a bunch of planets, and that's how he's going to win. And I take the research science route, and that's how I'm going to win. So what I loved about this was how I was able to unlock level one, which unlocked level two and I'm doing these crazy things that Kellen doesn't have any access to or other players don't have any access to and they have to go through multiple different actions to get there and so it feels like you just have these incredible powers that they don't have access to And there's just something so satisfying in like committing to that route and then uncovering what that looks like. And I think it makes every game different too, because you kind of try these different strategies and you get to see how they work differently with the different achievements and what the other players are doing. So I just thought that this was such a unique game for me and brought a lot of things to the table that I hadn't seen before. And I just have a ton of fun playing this game. Yeah, this is kicking around in my 50s for sure. And I just couldn't bear the thought of killing what was in my 1 to 50 to get it in there. I have high hopes for expansions for Beyond the Sun. And, you know, it gives me shades of innovation in a very different format, which is just how could you not want more innovation? I think that for me that this was the next 2020 game that was most likely to make my list. It came in so close to the end there that it was hard for me to formulate my thoughts on it exactly. But it's it's definitely the game that of almost any game we played in 2020 that I'm most excited to play more of. Tech trees, as you mentioned, Christina, are like pretty uncommon on of this variety of having like a tier one tech and a tier two tech and a tier three tech and feeling like you're just getting more and more powerful, crazy new technologies in a system that's variable from game to game is very cool. And all the moments where I was like drawing cards from the decks to like find what tech was going to be mine were so exciting to me. I'm like, oh man, this is crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For what it's worth, I know Kellen's going to make fun of this as he has been doing all series, is uh, this was my number 53 game. This just <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, of course <laughs> it was. Literally my number 53 game. Okay, uh, well, at least he's being precise and telling you which number it is, I've whereas Kellen's just like, this is in my 50s somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Kellen can say this is my 50s somewhere for 20 games. Share your spreadsheet, you liar. <laughs> <laughs> I will share my spreadsheet. I have nothing to hide. This is all for public <laughs> consumption. I love how like simple and straightforward it is. Like it's like a you know worker placement game, sort of like that's the core uh, mechanism, mm-hmm. and it's just super clean. You got one worker, you're moving them around. The board where you're managing your resources is very straightforward, but very interesting in how things interlock. I just really love it. It's a really nice design. right. That's a good point. I don't think we even went over too many rules before starting. Right, it's kind of like okay, these are the three things you need to know. You know, like worker placement. Let's do it, yeah. <laughs> and you just like get to uncover and like explore. Yeah. That is my 29th favorite game of all time, Beyond the Sun. All right. 
Let me ask you a question, everyone. Do you want to impress your friends? Yes. yes. Always. Of course you do. So what you say to them, you say, let's play a card game. What do they say back? This is not impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, ex- excuse me. This is my section. And they would say, like poker? And you would say, <laughs> it's exactly like poker, except we're all on the same team. Except we're all cockroaches? No. <laughs> except we're all on the same team. And no, no, no. Don't stop now. You're out. <laughs> You're cut. You're cut off. And then they would say, oh, okay, let's try it. And then you would say to them, except you also can't speak. And then you deal out the cards to them, and they're sitting there going, I don't know, this is, this is getting weird. And then you say, but wait, you hold the cards like this. And then a murmur goes around the crowd of your friends, a I hush. I think that they all would have left by now. <laughs> their minds are being bent. Their horizons are being lifted in real time. This is the 29th best board game of all time. Hanabi. Ooh. Hanabi is an incredible social experience, a <laughs> real a landmark of a design that has inspired so many knockoffs. There are so many that claim they do Hanabi, but with more fireworks, um, but you can't because Hanabi is Japanese for fireworks. If you don't want to hold the cards, you get Hanabi 2 Deluxe. You can play with dominoes. Okay, this is for everyone. I think a lot of people have, have heard of Hanabi now, but truly it is a game about trying to just create stacks of cards in all of the colors of the fireworks, but you have a very limited way in which you can communicate. You know, there is the crew is a perennial 2019 or 2020 favorite, depending on who you ask in terms of the year that it came out. And don't ask Neilan because he was wrong. But a game like the crew exists on the shoulders of Japanese fireworks Hanabi. My preference and one of my favorite games to play with complete non-gamers to bring out I think that for many people, Hanabi has a meta problem, and I don't use Hanabi in that way. I use Hanabi with new groups. It will never leave my collection unless it gets replaced, which it cannot be done because you cannot kill Hanabi. I think you hit on both like the strengths and like for what became for me the weakness of Hanabi is playing it in with repeat groups. But for me, it will always be, as you described, that stand out. I'm going to show you this game. And I'm going to watch your mind work as you realize how weird and different this is compared to other games you've played. And that's just a delight with every new group you show it to you. You say that you can't do Hanabi with more fireworks, but you can just make six cards and seven cards and eight cards, and then you got more fireworks. So there you that go. That is true. Or you could play it with people who claim they've beaten the game because they cheat at it. <laughs> and that also will bring out fireworks in me. <laughs> that is my number 29 favorite board game of all time, Hanabi. My number 28 favorite game of all time has dropped from 16 to 28. It was 30 the year before that. This is PAX Renaissance. This is a game that appeals to me because, and if you've listened to the show, you'll know, I'm a sucker for games that have a a strong historical theme and also games that pack a lot of cool historic information on their cards. It's an opaque game, so you know turns can take a little while as people are trying to figure out, especially in your first couple plays, but... I don't mind because I, I just love seeing like my tableau. It's got all these like figures from history and things that have happened during the time period. And I love just sitting there and reading about it. It's, it's honestly, I just, I find it fascinating. So you get annoyed when it's your turn and you have to stop reading. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Hold on. Hold on. I'm just finishing <laughs> things up on. Uh... So yeah, this is a game that shares a lot of DNA with PAX Premier. It has the same sort of card row, buying cards, and then adding them to Tableau, and then deciding whether or not to activate the powers of your cards. All right, Mark. Yes, sir. Question. So I think for most people, PAX Premier 2nd Edition is sort of the breakthrough into the masses PAX game. So yeah. why or how is PAX Renaissance different than PAX Premier 2nd Edition? I think the two things that sort of separate PAX Renaissance from PAX Premier, one and the, the most obvious one is the theme. So if you go to PAX Premier for the theme, if that's a part of the reason why you go to it, and that it is for me, then the idea that there's another lush theme is a draw that is appealing to me. The other thing is there is an economic aspect to PAX Renaissance that is in PAX Premier. There's like a trade route thing that PAX Premier doesn't have at all. It's certainly not like a reskin, nothing at all like a reskin, but it's got a similar system but with enough unique aspects to make it its own thing. And for me, just the theme being different and lush is enough for me to make it interesting to me. And I know you just you recently played Pax Preferiana, which is a game that I uh, have wanted to play for a long time and hopefully is my next. So that is Pax Renaissance, my number 28 game of all time. 
you move this down because you just haven't played it? Or yes, because... good question. Yeah, the reason I moved down is, yeah, I, I just haven't played it as much as I wanted to. I haven't played it this year at all. But genuinely, the denseness of the historical connection makes it a game that I, that is always appealing. And I just think it's a fun system. So if I don't play it again, then it may drop off the list. But for right now, I am very happy to have it here as my number 28 game. My number 28 game has fallen six spots. This is Archipelago. And I would say the only reason it's fallen is from time away. Like, I think that the length of time it's been since I last played Archipelago makes some of the rules grit and having to relearn the activation system sit a little bit less well with me for a game that's quite long and quite dense. It will probably be a struggle for us to return to. I have the flowchart to animate. <laughs> Kellen and I always sort of talk about the idea of taking the essence of Archipelago and boiling it down to a much simpler game. And I think in 2020, that idea sits a lot better with me in a way that makes Archipelago look less good in my head by comparison, which is sort of absurd, but that's how I feel. In comparison with, with the, the imaginary, imaginary better game. Uh, non-existent exactly, game. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. All that said, the reason Archipelago is still sort of holding tight in the middle of my list here is that there's nothing really quite like it. Like, is to me the king of the semi-cooperative game. It is a ecosystem that you're all taking a part in and you're trying to evaluate the way that other people are contributing to that ecosystem the way that they're hurting the ecosystem you're trying to figure out what their intent is through negotiations at various points in the game the whole thing is at risk of just like falling apart and you're trying to figure out if someone's deliberately tanking that game or what their motivations are and that just is fascinating to me this idea of this like economic system that everyone has different reasons and different means of interacting with and trying to figure out how and why they're doing what they're doing archipelago is super unique i think semi-cooperative games run a very dangerous tightrope that often doesn't work but archipelago still feels unique and rewarding to me every time i play it i have a question yeah if it weren't for you being bad at drawing the, <laughs> the exploration what are they called? tiles, exploration. Yeah. If, it weren't, if it weren't for you being bad at drawing the exploration tiles, would this be in your top Absolutely. Set? Yeah. If they fixed exploration, <laughs> it would be number one on my list. No, that is, a, that is a problem I have often said about Archipelago, which bugs me no end. But yes, uh, this is one of the... We've just had like, we've had explosive games of this yeah. where it's just uh, like you said it's like nothing else it is one of those experience games yeah exactly i think that's exactly right it is a rare sort of experience in terms of how often we've been able to return to it but nothing lives up in my memory to the highs of the best games of archipelago we've had one of the things i think that's worth saying that sort of i think becomes brought more to the light more and more in 2020 is some of the more potentially problematic elements of the theme of archipelago like it is a game that deals with colonization as a big part of its theme and bear that in mind if you plan on seeking this out that is my number 28 game archipelago my number 28 game of all time is hansa teutonica big box edition just kidding i don't really care <laughs> <laughs> So Hansa Teutonica is a medium weight strategy game and it's one that's very blocky, but it's one where you want to get blocked so that you can build more routes. At least that's how we always play. This game is all about deciding which powers to level up at which points in the game and kind of paying attention to what your opponents want so that their actions can work to your benefit. It's a straightforward Euro game, but it can feel super mean and it is super interactive. And I think that's kind of the sweet spot for our group anyways in terms of euro games and again i think for me the most interesting part and i guess especially like the first time i played it i was like oh i had this moment where it was like oh it's actually good like i want to use what they want to get what i want right yeah and that's just such a cool realization and then forevermore you just like want to use that to your <laughs> advantage it's such a cool unique part of the game couldn't agree more i absolutely love this game and that point is a great one yeah the fact that you want to get in everybody's way, and you don't want to just get in their way to hurt them, but it actually definitely improves your own gameplay, your own right, like, right, know, how right. you're doing. I think that if we were making sort of like the best collective, objective, best board games of all time list, I think there is a, a real case for Hansa Teutonica for being the best Euro game ever. I know that's a little weird in the context of our objective list uh, that we've made here, but Hansa Teutonica is just so pure. It really is in a, in a category of its own. And worth saying that that big box is brand new and on the market right now. And if you've not played Hansa Teutonica before, it is readily available for the first time in a while. At Game Nerds. <laughs> 
And that is Hansa Teutonica, my 28th favorite game of all time. My number 28th favorite game was a small Japanese card game, but then I was bullied online by a content creator who will not be named out loud. And I have substituted it back for Crass Carrier, Crass Carrier slash Delt. So this is released in America as Delt. Um, and there's a Japanese version called Scout that's sort of similar, but not. In this game, you're playing a traditional climbing or shedding type game where you're trying to make combos of cards in your hands and one-up each other, except, except you got to get a gimmick. And that gimmick is that you cannot reorder those cards in your hand. And you say, but wait, like, that doesn't make sense. You know, those games are already too luck-derived. Well, in, in Crass Carrier and Delt, and yes, someone on Patreon corrected me, and I'm sure I'm still butchering the pronunciation of this, but in this game, you have two cards in front of you that act as your lives. And when you can't play a card, you get to pick up one of those two cards and put it anywhere you want in your hand. And that's so cool because you're building the combos. You know, and you're sitting there each turn, you're playing cards out, and you're trying to build combos. So it may not be the best move for right now, but it allows you to push your cards together and make a combo that's going to be super great for the next turn. The other thing that I love about this specific version of the game is that there is not one winner. There is only one loser, which is something that we especially love at Board Game Barrage because for some reason, it is more fun to point at one person and call them a loser than to have one winner because then there are three losers. So for us and for us, when we play these type of small card games in a game like Cockroach Poker and, and again in like Delt and Crass Carrier, there's something just so satisfying about ganging up on people and trying to force them to be the one that has to take the aforementioned title of loser. This is a new game to my list. So excited to have it. Really, really, really enjoy this and would encourage everyone to give it a try. I mean, our descriptions of this game, both yours and Christina's earlier, just makes me like imagine us as like a pack of like hyenas, and we're just wa- <laughs> we're just watching each other for one person to start limping or something, and then we just attack him. That's how we it just is. tear that person. Yeah, that's true. People I mean, are shouting, true. "Get him! Get him! <laughs> <laughs> Kill Dylan! Kill him!" <laughs> yeah, are we the people that people don't want to play? Yeah, I think the cons? We're, we're, yes. That's- starting to make sense Definitely. i i remember playing this at strategicon just down in that main area and yeah. it just gets way louder than it should for what it is right i have a soft spot for card games like this that pack so much into such a small box and you just wonder wow i'm surprised this hasn't existed before and it's so clever that is my number 28th favorite game of all time crass carrier delt or if you want to take a trip to nippon you can get scout which is not exactly the same game. I, it's close enough that we're uh, playing in the same world. My number 27 is a new entry to the list. This was battling with its older brother, Great Western Trail. This is Maracaibo. This is Fister's other rondelle on a board sort of game where you're just moving your piece around the rondelle and taking actions and making loops. I will say that I think one of the reasons that Maracaibo is higher than Great Western for me right now is just the newness of it. It's a more sprawling game than Great Western Trail, but that may not bear out as a positive. That may be a negative in the end because it is more fiddly because of that. But for right now, the fiddliness pays off to me at least. And that is because the multi-use cards, somebody asked me earlier, I said that Bruges had dropped off my list because I had played other multi-use card games that sort of evoked the same thing, but I thought maybe were better. And this is the first game that popped to mind when they asked me to which games I was referring to. Maracaibo has cards that you pick up as you travel around the Rondelle that give you powers and just you know make your own experience unique in the same way that bruges when you're picking up cards and playing them based on the cards you play your experience is going to be changed drastically from game to game same thing happens with maracaibo where you're purchasing cards and it's just going to make your experience different and what you're going for different it's got the rondelle system which is unique and interesting from great western trail so that's still there uh, and still cool it's got this push and pull aspect where you're sort of fighting for the favor of the three nations that are depicted it's spain england and france they're not really powers that are in play you don't really see their presence on the board but you can sort of work on behalf of the different powers and at the end whoever has the most influence with the the power that is doing the best gets the most points and so you can sort of see you know england or spain or france getting stronger or weaker and you sort of want to curtail your experience to them and, and just that push and pull of 
trying to drag down a country or trying to push up a country that you're backing is an interesting aspect that wasn't present in Great Western Trail. Just a lot of interesting things building on the Great Western Trail thing that, again, in the end, I may start feeling that it's a bit bloated. There's certainly that possibility. But for right now, the newness of it just is sort of interesting to me. Regardless of whether or not it drops or uh, rises, it's certainly a solid game from the Mr. Fister himself. That's all I wanted to add, Mr. Fister. (laughs) You got it. All I wanted to add was that is the beauty of these lists, is that they are both objective and... Ephemeral. Fluid, living, breathing things all at once. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. They're certainly not subjective, though. (laughs) And there's fights between brothers, and sometimes the younger brother wins. That's right. That's right. Excuse me? (laughs) Maracaibo's the younger brother. Maracaibo's the younger brother. Great Western Trail. That is Maracaibo, my 27th favorite game of all time. The 27th best game of all time has rocketed up my list from number 50 last year. This is up 23 spots. It is the game that I think I've played the most in quarantine because i've been playing it by myself christina can i get a woohoo it is twice as clever this is an excellent roll and write this is my favorite solo game this is a game that works as well solo as it does multiplayer and which is especially interesting for a roll and write because it's a genre that is not governed by having exceptionally strong interaction but what twice as clever does so cleverly if i may is that when you pick a die it is going to be a die that you're taking away from the other players and sometimes that selection is more important than the die you're keeping for yourself especially if you're playing this at two there is a lot of intense scrutiny at what the other player needs versus what you do you're picking colored dice which are going to fill specific spots on your score sheet which are all little mini games so there's one where you're trying to get the numbers in ascending order you're trying to get pairs of numbers you're trying to get groups of numbers and it just feels like a really 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 fun puzzle and the key thing that sort of heightens this game for me is it has this beautiful point around halfway where things just start popping off and like comboing off each other and one thing triggers you writing something in this point which triggers you writing something in this point and you're suddenly writing things all over the board because you set up this little chain of events and it's so satisfying Very simple. I think the fox is honestly the best part because the fox is, at the end of the game, the amount of foxes you have is multiplied by your lowest section score. And the way that I play this is I always go, oh, yeah, I'm going to get so many foxes, you know, and I... And then near the middle of the game, I'm like, oh, yeah, I want more foxes, more foxes. And then I get to the last round and I have like a, a fat zero <laughs> in one of the categories. But I got a lot of foxes. That's what matters. The foxes tempt yeah. you in a way that I think is really fun. Right. And that's the tension is that you can't let any one color get too exactly. low. Um, I taught this to my brother over this Christmas. And I thought this was a simple game. But wow, it was really hard to teach. And I was really sad because like he didn't really get to that point where he got to see all the combos happening. But that is also my favorite part of it is just like, you're right, like somewhere in the middle, you get to this point and you're like, yes, it's all working. <laughs> and especially with the app, it's all happening right. for you. And it's just woohoo, 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 woohoo. You know? <laughs> it's great. Now that you mentioned it, though, like there is something that is maybe unsaid about this stuff. there is a lot of thinkiness to it like you know it, it is not a simple game to wrap your head around in terms of the strategy right because trying to find the best way to focus your actions on specific sections and when to do that to maximize your scoring potential is a very learned very puzzly thing that is not that common to the genre which tends to be more press your luck oriented and it's not super intuitive right. either. It takes a little bit, but all you need is the app, two ninety nine on the App Store, and then you can just play over and over and over, and then you'll be happy forever. <laughs> exactly. That is twice as clever at number 27. My 27th favorite game of all time comes to us from our good friend, Carl Chudiak. Does anybody have any guesses to what this game might be? Mr. Chudiak making an appearance at number 27. Okay, I'll tell you. It's Glory to Rome. So this is a crazy game. This is a city building resource management game. It's a card game where each card has five different possible uses. 
with six different action types <laughs> and like a weird role based phase order. It is super complicated. This is another one. It is not simple to teach. It's not simple to understand the first time you play it or the second time you play it. The rule book actually says, don't be sad the first time you play this when you have no idea what's going on <laughs> because nobody does. I mean, literally one card can have five different uses. Like, think about that. And that's, you know, in classic Carl form, it just creates for a combo-rific, tough decision-filled game every single time. Classic um, Carl. C-T- yeah, classic Carl. CCC, classic Carl Chudiak. Yep. Triple C. I, Triple feel C. Like, I feel like we're doing him dirty if we're giving other people honorary doctorates <laughs> calling this man classic <laughs> Carl. <laughs> oh, classic Carl. That's a good point. <laughs> Mr. Classic Carl? Dr. Classic Carl? I guess Mr. Fister may be at the bottom <laughs> <laughs> of the naming. Hierarchy. I like Classic Carl. Uh, yeah, Glory to Rome. You know, Carl Chudiak is probably Christina and I's favorite collective designer. Glory to Rome has a, a tenuous history, and you may have trouble finding it. I know a lot of people print and play it now, but it's sort of considered innovation's more orderly older brother so to speak, where um, you're, you're doing an action-follow type system. It is spectacular. It is unique and interesting. And it is one that you can play with people who love crazy combos, but also people who are okay with a little bit more order in their system and really speaks to what you can do with just cards and truly a, an amazing design and, and one that's worth celebrating. Yeah, obviously, Carl Chadiak being our collective favorite designer, as Kellen said, it's no question which is his best game. And that's the game we play every single day, and it's called Flowerfall. No. Okay. <laughs> I did it bad. Classic Carl told you not to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> that is my 27th favorite game of all time, Glory to Rome. So you say to your friends, do you guys w- want to play a game? And they're like, <laughs> like poker? And you say, exactly. Doctor, Except doctor, this time it's made by the only the true news, and living doctor. And that poker game is called Taj Mahal. You. Oh, now you've really impressed them. Taj Mahal is my 27th favorite board game of all time. It manages to combine quite a few things in a system that is just crazy novel. And I think that sort of typifies my entire list is an experience that I typify, can't... Typify, 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 typify. Uh, an experience typify. that I can't get anywhere else in that you are playing a series of hands and those hands are giving you abilities that affect the board state. And what you're doing in the board state is sort of route building, um, trying to get majorities in different sections to score points in a traditional Euro, kind of boring, old school Feld-like type system. But the way that you do that is so interesting, which is, you know, I may play two elephants. And if I can get back to my turn without anyone beating my amount of elephants, I can withdraw and take the elephant and have won that section. And so the game really is about playing a counselor card and then saying, Neelan, you don't. You really don't want to be in this counselor card with me. And then Neelan plays it and then you yell at him. Really simple game that has a ton of tension. And one of my favorite things about it is that it's not afraid to be punitive. You know, many of these type of auction games allow you to take back that which you have bid because they're for Care Bears, but not the only true and living doctor. Taj Mahal, if you commit and you don't get, you get got. And that's what oh, I love. Oh, did you make that up? You, wh- are you kidding? Every you? Every thought I have is an independent Wait, say it doctor. again. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely cannot. I don't know what I said. <laughs> that was good. It truly, I think it was, if you commit and you don't get, you get got. Is that what it was? Man, that's not as good as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that turned... <laughs> <laughs> it really is if I can convince Neelan to play five elephants and I play six, Neelan is the one that has lost all of his cards. And that punitive relationship with the tight route building and scoring opportunities in a, in a relatively straightforward Euro game is a unique experience and one that I think that everyone should try at some point, a very interactive and social Euro game. That is Taj Mahal, my 27th favorite board game of all time. Quick thing about Taj Mahal, it's like a game that I completely respect and I see how great it is, but it's like the one great Kinesia game that I just do not connect with. I don't know why. It just it just does not work for me for whatever reason. But but it's obviously a great game. I think you're outvoted. We love Taj Mahal, all three of us. No, I I would happily play it for sure, but for whatever reason, like with a lot of other Kinesia games, like I just love them. And Taj Mahal I, I think it's like the fact that, you know, you have to build for later rounds and I just for some reason I just either don't do it right or I'm not seeing something and I, my plans always fall short and I just have some sort of hang up with it. 
I do think it is weird because there are rounds that you just have to lose. Yeah. Right. I don't. Right. I, I don't like that where it's just like I'm here for the cards this time. Sure. Like I, I actually I don't like that part of it, but it's like biding your time. You know, every dog has his day. Exactly. Um, and it's just right now. It's not your day. My number twenty six favorite game of all time is a hybrid of the train game system and Euro games. This is a game we all play together. City of the Big Shoulders. It's a game that makes 18xx games like sort of into a Euro game. So we all played this, and I was heartened to see that. I think you guys enjoyed the play because it made me think that you would like uh, 18xx games. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what it is. It's, it's the Eurification of 18xx games. I like the fact that the abstractions from 18xx are done well. They sort of like feel like they're retaining what made them fun in 18xx games, but in euro form it feels like a, a very nice analogous situation i also like again it's not as steeped in history as a lot of the other games that i like but i like that this is like based on chicago around the like industrial revolution and you know you can play these very famous american companies that are all sort of unique instead of owning different train companies you can choose a famous company that that was based in chicago at the time and they all have their own unique advantages and disadvantages that make it asymmetric just a a really nice blend of 18xx and euro a game i really like and a game that i uh played again this year and i'm looking forward to playing more that is my number 26 favorite game of all time city of the big shoulders one day mark do you think we could do an episode where it's called history class with mark taught through board games you pull out all of the games in your top 50 that are history related and then you just like compile it into one big history class i'm down for it we can start with like ancient egypt with Ra. i think we're gonna need a different mark to uh teach us that in the board game oh plan. that's that's me oh big me a more educated <laughs> <laughs> you guys could both work together be careful what you wish for Callan. <laughs> mark squared m2 <laughs> City of the Big Shoulders is fantastic. I, you know, the ability to buy and sell the corporations is, is so interesting and so fascinating. I think that I need to play an 18xx proper game to really evaluate this and put it in its place. I think I'm still looking for something that's more pure. It's just about buying and selling the companies right? without all the riffraff. You know, like the olive branch to heavy Euro players is not really an olive branch sure. that I care about. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I burned down that tree. Yeah. My number 26 game has moved up from the 32 spot, up six spots. This is Where Words, and this is going to be one of my go-to mainstays in that category of games that I would take to parties of people I don't know. I think social deduction is very good in that space, but if Resistance is the more gamery version of this that I would want to play more regularly with people that I know are more comfortable with board games, Where Words by building on 20 questions, which is a game that everyone knows, and adding that little twist of, but one of these people is working against the group. And again, like we were talking about with Hanabi, just watching people's eyes light up at the prospect of that idea is a really cool thing. This is built upon Insider, which we have a lot of debate as to which of the two is the better game. For me, I think the addition of the roles is something I appreciate in WearWords. I think that the app works extremely well. So production quality issues aside, I think the Oink package is a beautiful thing. I would still would prefer to play WearWords. Also, if you're going to a party and you want to impress your friends, like we all agreed we want to impress our friends, WearWords is kind of like you're a little kid and insiders, you're an adult. <laughs> sure. I would take it to children's <laughs> I, parties, to be perfectly clear. <laughs> Insider is coming up in this episode for me. So this is just such a fantastic game system. And I do agree with Christina that if you pulled out that app and it was like, everyone, close your eyes. So this is like then you would get laughed at and not invited back to the parties, which is probably why you're at parties with a bunch of people you don't (laughs) know um, because you don't get invited back. It's weird. I do have to find a new party every single time I want to play WearWords. I'm not sure what's up with that. But yeah, WearWords is fantastic and it seems to be creeping up my list a little bit more every single year. It is now at number 26, WearWords. I will say this game rose in my estimation quite a bit because this was the first time I tried playing it with my non-gaming family over the holidays and I was just really really impressed by how quickly they took to it and how much fun we all had much younger nieces and nephews just immediately took to it and it was really really fun my 26th favorite game of all time is 
another doctor doctor, doctor. doctor. <laughs> uh, the doctor's back i'm not gonna sing that again because i already embarrassed myself the doctor is back <laughs> with modern art <laughs> I believe this is a, is this double, a double crossover. crossover yeah, this was number 50 Thank on my you. list. And number 26 on my list. So, wow. <laughs> Modern art is an auction game in which you're buying and selling art and really, really hoping that you're selling for the right prices and buying the right type of art, which is really hard if you're playing with <laughs> Mark because Mark always wins these auction games and I never do. But I still have a lot of fun. I love how tense this particular auction game is in comparison to others. Like this is more on the stressful realm of things. I feel like it's a thinkier auction game than others. And I don't know if it's mathier, but I'm bad at math. So everything's mathier <laughs> to me. It stays really interesting because there are numerous types of auctions and every round builds upon the last in terms of the value of the art. So you just have to constantly be thinking of all of these different factors. It's very hard and it's very fun. And again, I just feel like it's kind of a one of a kind within the auction game yep. realm. Yeah, for me. I think it also like adding that like element of uncertainty of the reveal of whether an artist is going to do well or not is always just fun because there's a little bit of like, is this artist going to bust or not? And then the person that's invested a lot into them gets ruined by it. It just has fun little spikes like that. Right. That is my 26th favorite game of all time, Modern Art. Goodbye, Doctor. My number 26th favorite board game of all time is coming to us from a little pig from Japan. Ooh, here we go. Mark. Kelly. Kelly, did you listen? No. Oh, my gosh. I heard it's awful. <laughs> okay, I just want to say pigs are really cute, and you not made the them not, that, not sound so cute. What, what kind of pigs are It sounds, I mean, it sounds like it's snorting up all the mud and then vomiting it out. <laughs> Okay, I don't know how the internal systems work, but... <laughs> so this Oink game is perhaps my favorite production of a board game. I'm very into the aesthetics of what a game presents and everything sort of having its place. And startups, for me, just exist in this cool space. It's just cool. You know, when Nintendo created Splatoon, I was just like, man, I wish I was as cool as the kids in Splatoon but I'm not. And there's something in startups where, you know, it's just this beautiful, evocative artwork, these made up companies, and you combine all of that with a color palette that is just to die for. This is sort of the realm of what I work in, you know, advertising and art and graphic design. And I just, everything about startups, I love. And then you combine that with the gameplay, which does not disappoint at all, which is a, a simple card game. But the deeper you go into any suit, the more you're going to get got by someone who's gone deeper than you. I absolutely love that concept where you are trying to hide what you're invested in for as long as possible. And then when you have to, it becomes a battle. It becomes you and Mark fighting over the condoms. And one of you is going to have to pay the other one. I know this is a double crossover with Christina. <laughs> yeah, it's a double crossover. And I was just remembering last week's episode when Neilan made like the funniest joke in the entire history I of the podcast. I remember it was. But I... Oh, I remember now. It was something about how like... None of your yeah, dating, my your least favorite, favorite dating, dating include condoms or yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Startups is delightful. It's a quintessential card game that doesn't come in one of those boring boxes that a game like Delt or Llama or No Thanks. They all come in that too American for me. Startups, my twenty sixth favorite board game of all time. My twenty fifth favorite board game of all time is down from thirty three the year before. This is The Great Zimbabwe, a splatter game. This is another weird game. There's, this is like seems to be a section of my list where a lot of weird, unique games lie. Great Zimbabwe is strange because it's sort of a logistical game where you are succeeding by um, sort of building a nice structure, but also being able to use the infrastructure that other folks have built. And another thing I really like about it is the fact that its asymmetry is one that you sort of can pick. So there are different powers that you can choose during the course of the game. And depending on which power you select, it moves your target victory points up. So, for example, I think at the start of the game, if you get 20 victory points, you win the game. But if you elect to select this power or that power, that may bump your target score to a higher number. And I just love how that's something that you have to consider. Like, you know, you can select a couple different powers and if you think they synergize well enough to make up for the 
shift in victory point target, then you go for them. And that's just a, a really interesting aspect of the game. Just a one-of-a-kind game that I really, really enjoy. That is my number 25 game, The Great Zimbabwe. I developed a great appreciation of The Great Zimbabwe in 2020. I played a lot of it for some reason online. I don't love it. I sort of came to like respect what it was doing, especially after not loving my first play of it. But I think Splotters and I don't fundamentally agree on a lot of levels. Yeah, I get that. There's a much bigger rant about Splotter games in the wings that I would like to do. But yeah, interesting. So unique, man. This is Great Zimbabwe. Yeah. Again, nothing quite like it. My 25th favorite game of all time has fallen a little bit for spots uh, after having played a few games of it last year. I think my enthusiasm for the system waned a little. This is Aeon's End. Uh, it is still a solid game, an excellent cooperative deck builder, where the novelty comes in how variable each of like the boss encounters is. I've always described this as feeling like video game bosses, in that every time you encounter one of the bosses, which is effectively the scenarios that you play, you have to learn how to defeat the boss. The boss has monsters associated with it. The boss has effects associated with it that change the rules of each of the scenarios of this cooperative deck builder. And it's about trying to sort of figure out its systems and find the way to best build your deck to overcome it specifically. It's such an interesting system and there are just so many bosses now available for it. I think there are three or four different versions of Aeon's End that are all compatible with each other. Excellent game. I would recommend jumping in at either uh, Aeon's End Legacy if you wanted the campaign ramp up or Aeon's End War Eternal was my first game and I still see that recommended as a good first version to play. But that is Aeon's End at number 25. Video game bosses suck. <laughs> I disagree. My number 25 favorite game of all time is Chaos in the Old World. So first I wanted to read the first description that is listed on BGG. And it is that Chaos in the Old World makes you a god. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was really funny. But I mean, yes, you are playing as a god. So, but I read it. <laughs> okay, so Chaos in the Old World is the classic Eric Lang troops on a map game with asymmetric player powers game. Um, as we've discussed on this podcast before, uh, we are all huge fans of Cthulhu Wars and Cthulhu Wars was extremely inspired by Chaos in the Old World and a lot of the mechanics that we love in Cthulhu Wars are literally taken <laughs> from chaos in the old world. For example, like the power mechanism is identical. The asymmetric player powers. Some of the unique things about chaos in the old world that I really love include the ways that you can win the games. So there are two ways to win the game, and that's either kind of the traditional way by hitting 50 victory points before everyone else, or there is the threat dial. And this is really interesting because every single player has a different way to advance their threat dial. Some gods have an easier time at advancing their dial. Some gods are better at going the, the traditional route. But it's just such a fun way to play where you're exploring this new player power and you're also exploring what that means for winning the game. And so I remember when I, the first time we played, I was the corn faction and they are pretty good at advancing their dial. And I think that I was kind of the only one that was like, okay, I'm going all in on the dial route and everybody else was sort of playing a different game and that was just really interesting and then on subsequent plays it, it's a completely different experience i love this game i love troops on a map games and this one is just such a classic it's way more complicated than cthulhu wars i will say but in some good ways too yeah i love this game as well as this is a double crossover this was earlier on my list number 48 but yeah absolutely this is an early super asymmetric troops on a map game and like you said you know cthulhu wars definitely draws a line from that game to to itself just great great game it's mr lang and mr sandy peterson uh both could not have picked more boring themes that i i, I can't decide which i care about less uh Picks. mr cthulhu and friends use or... me warhammer uh, want to be great classic the board is human skin oh my god fantasy. aren't we so edgy Ugh. we're so edgy my name is corn with an h in it <laughs> blood okay. for the blood god. that's a warhammer thing <laughs> <laughs> this is again another reason that you're keep having to go to new parties <laughs> that is chaos in the old world my 25th favorite game of all time
My 25th favorite game of all time uh, is occupying the same slot as last year. This is a Keyflower. Keyflower is shockingly good. Every time I play it, I am in love with the decision making that you have to make in the game. It actually reminds me a little bit of a a newer game that I also like called Square on Sale, where there are sort of multiple simultaneous auctions happening, and you basically are having to figure out where to go and when. Because in a game of Keyflower, there are a bunch of tiles. You want all the tiles, but you can't have all the tiles. And you have multiple different colors of meeples with which to bid with. But if you're the first person to bid, you get to choose the color for that auction. So you may have four of one color, and you're really hoping that you can win with only two, and you only have two blue. So you put out both of them. You just hope that no one is going to go there. But at the same time, you're also able to use the worker placement spots instead of bidding on acquiring one of them for your kingdom. And that's fascinating because if it's a tile in your own kingdom, you can get that part of that meeple back. But if you are using someone else's worker placement spot, they're going to get that meeple in a subsequent round. So just the ability on any turn, it's not... Sometimes an auction you know, has a cadence to it where it's just around and around. This is an auction, like a living and breathing auction where you're having to decide, should I use worker placement spots or should I be bidding to acquire more things? And when should I commit? And people don't know what color I have. Just a tremendously interesting auction and worker placement game. There are some things I dislike about it. I know know Neelan's going to come in, blah, blah, blah. I don't like it, how you have to move the resources back around on your thing. And I would say to Neelan, (laughs) get good. Keyflower, just an amazing game. And one that I would never say no to. It's it's not always the first one that I bring out. But someone's like, yeah, Callan, do you want to play Keyflower? Of course I want to play Keyflower. I would love to play more Keyflower. There's a lot of expansions waiting in the wings. If I have a, an island or you know the whole world ends, who can say how? You know, I'd love to have all the expansions for Keyflower and really explore that system. I love this game. I haven't played it enough. And that's why it's not on my top 50. But I love it. I share Neelan's not loving the moving resources around aspect of the game. I was hoping that Keith to the City London, uh, which was a sort of re-implementation of Keyflower that promised to take that aspect away, would make for a better game. It does not. It's the worst game, in my opinion. And like Christina also said, I think it would probably rise on my list if I played it more. I love the bidding aspect and like the locking people out of bids and that kind of stuff is really, really cool. So, yeah. My 24th favorite game of all time is a game that I've talked about a little earlier in speaking about uh, PAX Renaissance. This is the other PAX game on my list, PAX Premier 2nd Edition. I spoke about PAX Premier when speaking about PAX Renaissance, so I won't belabor the point too much, but it's got the same sort of thing. It's got, you know, rich historical theme. It's got cards that sort of they're not really multi-use cards, but cards that can do a lot of different actions based on the way you use them. The second edition adds a incredible production quality aspect to it where it's got a cloth mat and the uh, pieces are resin? Resin pieces? Is that what they are? I think that's right. There's something cool. There's some magic sauce in that production. If even Mark is getting got by it. By what? By how cool they are? Yeah, the that's production. You don't even give it. <laughs> that's true. I'm still happy to play the first edition, although I think the second edition makes improvements. But yeah, just a totally up my alley, historically steeped game with a lot of cool flavor text that I am happy to read. And an interesting theme, interesting part of history, interesting mechanics where you're joining forces with different world powers that are battling over the region and you can change your allegiance. Uh, just a lot of cool things that I really like about it. Pax Premier second edition, my number 25 favorite game of all time, up from 33 last year. Do not play PAX Premier 2nd Edition with Callan. <laughs> Get good. I can't wait, Mark, to take you to Porfiriana so you can learn about Diaz and uh, Get Got in other different ways. It's a highly interactive version of, of what I am about. It's wild. That and Lords of Vegas and Dogs of War, these are all like games that I'm super eager to play. Absolutely. My number 24 game has held its same spot from last year. This is Spirit Island. This is my favorite non-campaign cooperative game. I think the thing that is so great about Spirit Island for me is how different it feels every time you play it, provided you're playing with a different spirit. So each spirit has a completely different play style, a different selection of starting cards, and interacts with the board in a completely different way. The premise of the game is you have a map in which invaders are settling and you play an ancient god of this island and you're sort of trying to help the natives by sort of dispersing the invaders, by eliminating from them from the map eventually or scare them enough. And 
the spirits each just have unique ways of interacting with that, whether it's pushing people into the ocean or sort of having big bursts of damage or instilling fear among them. It feels very substantially different with each spirit you play. And the thing that's the next twist on that is every game you play is a unique combination of different players' spirits. And that is kind of like the core of the beauty of the puzzle of Spirit Island is how best does my spirit interact with your spirit? Especially if you play this in like a three or four player game, which wouldn't necessarily be my favorite player counts, but there's this question of, okay, I'm going to work with Kellen over here in this unique way that our spirits interact. I'm going to work with Mark over here and Christina on this sector of the board, and we're going to have to find the way to utilize our spirits' strengths to best help our collective mission of wiping the settlers from the map. It's such an interesting design with, to my mind, a beautiful sort of board presence. It's plastic and wood and bright, vibrant cardboard and beautiful card art. I really, really dig Spirit Island. It's quite a complex cooperative game. But if you enjoy cooperative games and are looking for quite a few notches up your traditional cooperative weight, I definitely think you should check out Spirit Island at number 24. My 24th favorite game of all time is Rumble Nation. I think this is a double crossover. Double crossover. Double crossover. Rumble Nation is a dice rolling area control game. It is shockingly short and simple for how much it packs in. The most unique thing about this game and what I like most is the way it resolves. So I think Kellen probably already talked a little bit about this in the previous episode, but I'm going to go over just how the end game works. Every game has a unique order to which area score in which order, and each area only resolves once. So this is super important because... As the areas resolve, they impact who wins the majority in the surrounding areas. So, for example, if Region 1 is surrounded by Regions 2, 4, 5, and 6, the winner of Region 1 will get to add reinforcement troops to 2, 4, 5, and 6 as long as they've previously placed at least one troop in those areas during the game. So there's this incredible cascading effect that forces you to make really precise and really well-timed moves throughout the game, while simultaneously there are tons of other factors going on, and one of those is that you're Facing your opponents for the tiebreaker because that can be super impactful because every single time you resolve an area, if you're tied, then you win. And again, and that spills over to the surrounding areas and it just cascades to the higher point areas toward the end of the resolution of the game. This game, I mean, it is so fast. It's super tense. It's blocky. It's competitive. It's so much fun. It's so quick. We just play it again and again and again. I love this game and and I can't wait to get it back to the table because it's been a while. But I just have so much fun playing this game. The balance between, you know, wanting to win an area that will score you a lot of points is that area does not affect the surrounding areas and, and help you reinforce troops. So either something goes off early, it's not going to get you that many points, but it's going to reinforce other areas. Just a, a smashingly great design. And that is Rumble Nation, my 24th favorite game of all time. My 24th favorite board game of all time. This is the highest Martin Wallace game on my list. This is the second edition of A Study in Emerald. To be clear, I have not played the first edition of Study in Emerald. I know that has some ardent supporters. But in A Study in Emerald second edition, there are two teams who are working with or against Mr. Cthulhu and friends. Yawn. I'm tired of them. But uh, what's so unique about it is that you don't know how many people are on your team. You may be the only one on your team. And when you score points in the game, points are awarded to specific factions. And so you could score a point, but at the end of the game, you actually don't score that point because you're not part of that faction. But it looks like you're moving up the score track, and then you reveal at the end of the game, and, and you move down. Just a truly novel experience. I could talk about this game for a long time and then not even mention the fact that it has a little bit of deck building in it. So you're visiting different locations. You don't know who's on your team. This is one that I love and think could probably be replaced. There is some creakiness. There's some unwieldiness here. But I just love what it forces you to do, how it forces you to think and not know or help and hurt other players in a game that is more tightly designed. I can't say enough good things about A Study at Emerald 2nd Edition. I would love to explore this more. This is one that I think you could play with the same group back-to-back four times and have four crazy different experiences and just have stories that you'd tell forever and ever. I really like Wallace's designs. I think they're always interesting. And this is one that I have not played that is on that list I was referring to earlier of games I really, really want to play. 
And that is A Study in Emerald, the second edition, but I would love to try with uh, people the first edition, which I hear is even crazier and more unwieldy in terms of some of the crazy wind conditions going on in this game. My number 23 is a double crossover with uh, Christina's earlier mention of Glory to Rome. What was his name? Classic, Classic Carl. Carl. Classic, Classic Carl. Carl strikes again. I won't belabor this game because you know, eloquently already described it. But yes, this is like the granddaddy of multi-use cards. A game where you can have big swings when you build a, a very cool building that changes things drastically. Yeah, just a, a fantastic classic card game from the classic one himself, uh, Mr. Chudiak. That is Glory to Rome, my 23rd favorite game of all time. Yeah, I'm from 22, but still in the same ballpark. My number 23 best board game of all time has moved up a few spots from 29 to 23. This is a Dr. Knizia game. The Quest for El Dorado. This is Dr. catching up on Give Dominion as my favorite I deck builder. I think one of the things that separates it from other deck builders, which are you. typically about just getting high point value cards into your deck or in the Ascension style of just beating down the opponent. This is a race game. I think race games have a beauty to them because you can explain them to anyone. Get to this point first and you've won. All the cards are about navigating across the map and the order in which you acquire them is going to depend on the specific track you've laid out because it has a modular board. So you might want to invest heavily into machetes early on to get through the jungle. You might want to invest heavily into buying cards early on so that you can get the cards that you need down the line in typical deck builder fashion. It has a fair bit, especially at the higher player counts, of interactive blocking where you just annoyingly sit on the spot that someone needs to get through and you cannot pass through a spot that another player is in. So there's this capitalizing on choke points and getting there at the appropriate time to most annoy other people that I just find very really delightful in what is a pretty accessible first deck builder, even for people that aren't familiar with the genre. Beautiful, simple game that I think is probably... The closest to a family weight board game on my list, I would still happily play any day. You know, it strikes me, Neelan, that, you know, everyone is going gaga for um, Arnok and Dune Imperium, which combine deck building with worker placement with a board. And oh my God, it's so novel. But really, when you're playing Quest for Eldorado and your, your piece is there and you, you look at the board and you go, huh, I've got to cross the jungle, you know, and after I get to the jungle, I got the water. And then I got a little bit more jungle and then the desert. And what you buy, you know, do I buy what I need now because I got across the jungle or do I buy what I need later? And it really does have that sort of like epic adventure that you're like, you want your deck to work for now and for later in a way that's really impacted by the board in a way that these other worker placement games, like like it's not really that interesting where this is like, super right. hyper focused on what you're and doing that was it's actually the last novel. thing i was going to say that in some ways it's the most worthy of being a deck builder of these sort of hybrid games because of that exact trade-off of like do i need something now does it need to sit in my deck for longer at what point do i need to guarantee that it gets into my deck so that it will pay off and you can see the whole track laid out before you at the start so you can plan the points that you're going to put cards into your deck it's really really smart yeah, I think the word you used is like delightful. And that's exactly how it feels to play this whole game. It's just like the all of the systems are so elegant and simple. And it just like you said, you look at the board and you just plan it all out. And it, like Kellen said, it feels yeah. like this adventure that you're going on in a way that not very many other games feel. Yeah, I, I right. love this game. That is the quest for El Dorado <laughs> at number 23. It's funny, like the same as Taj Mahal. This is a game by Kinesia that I totally respect, that I would be happy to play again, but it just doesn't do it for me for whatever reason. Don't know why. My 23rd favorite game of all time is a game that was potentially one of the highlights for all of us at Dice Tower West this year, and that is The Crew. The Crew is amazing. The Crew is a cooperative trick-taking game that gives you 50 missions to work through with your friends or really anyone else because it's so much fun that you don't even need to be friends <laughs> to have fun with this game. So obviously this is a double crossover with yep. Mark, I believe. That's correct. Okay, so yes, this is a double correct. crossover. He t- just spoke about it and I think I even said like, wow, you described it so well. I don't know what I'm going to say, but here I go. I love how it can feel like the stakes aren't that high while still providing the tension of not wanting to let your teammates down. So it's not like that 
silent tension you get in Hanabi where you feel like one move is going to ruin the entire game and you're just like trying to you really don't want to let your teammates down. It doesn't have that because each mission is so short and it allows for this added silliness in each game because every five minutes there's this release valve of someone messing up or something going completely wrong and it's hilarious and then you just start the mission over. So we just have had so much fun with this game. That's my number 23 best board game of all time, The Crew. All right, my number 23 favorite board game of all time. This has fallen from previously was my number 12 favorite game of all time. This is Codenames. Now, Codenames is falling, but Codenames is amazing. Let's not belabor the point. If you're listening to this podcast, you have heard of Codenames. And if you have not, I don't know where you live because, you know, even normies on Amazon have heard of this game. I love, I love, love, love reading Amazon reviews for modern hobbyist games. There's always a one-star review and it's always like, we're college educated (laughs) and we could not figure out how to play this game. So one out of five stars. It seems like it's like Risk, but it's not. Anyway, Codenames is a fantastic word game. It's a word party game that works best, probably at four or at six. I've worn it out. I've played it so many times. I would never say no to code names, but I just, I don't bring it out anymore. I bring out other games when I want to play a word game. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's the only good game that Vlada Chivatol has ever made. How dare you. Uh, and that is my <laughs> number 23rd favorite board game, Codenames. To Kellen's point, I mean, C- Codenames is a game that I always think I'm sick of. And then whenever it gets played, I've said this before, whenever we play it, it's always a great time. Always. My number 22 favorite game of all time. Christina just mentioned that we linked up on the crew. I'm going to return the favorite here as this is, I think now a triple crossover to be fair. Modern Arts by the Doctor himself. <laughs> Triple, <laughs> crossover. Triple crossover. That's right. Give Again, me the Christina's already mentioned this earlier in the episode, so I won't take too long on it. But another thing you. that I like about this game is the way that, even though it is probably not meant to be overly thematic, I just love the idea that it's like a take on the modern art world. Only the hottest artists are the ones that actually are worth points, and uh, an artist's previous history can't help them unless they're out of favor in the current round, and in which case they're worthless. I just think that's a really, maybe not completely intentional, but I'm sure there's some intention. And just it's just a very cool take on the idea of modern art being a fleeting sort of like uh, business, for lack of a better term. So yeah, my 22nd favorite game of all time is The Doctor's Own Modern Art. My 22nd favorite game of all time is Patchwork. I talk a lot about polyomino games on this podcast and patchwork for me is the benchmark in simple polyomino games it's also got a little bit of surprise engine building going on in there because there's this balance of building up your button economy and doing this at the expense of time which is one of patchwork's most ingenious mechanics the idea that any time you take a polyomino piece to fit on your board, it's going to cost a different amount of time. And that's going to move you further down the time track. And when that gets to the end, you literally have run out of time and cannot place any more pieces. But not only that, but it determines how you move in turn order. If you take a piece that costs a lot of time, you move further down the track. And then the other player can potentially just keep taking places until they catch up with you. The idea is that you're quilting these little polyomino pieces into your little quilt you're acquiring buttons which you then use to buy new tiles and that's kind of the gist of the game it is a two-player exclusive game a very simple game that has a lot more below the surface than it looks like it does at first appearances it's also had a couple of new cool additions that came out this year so there is probably a patchwork flavor that would appeal to you most if you are a christmas person or a i don't know what the other versions are Americana, Americana person. That is real. That's real. That's a real aversion. I think that it is a cute, simple polyomino game that should be in everyone's collection. <laughs> Patchwork. Isn't it about time? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> That's good. My 22nd favorite game of all time is a da double crossover with Neelan from this episode. So very exciting. It is Colorado. Colorado. I love Colorado. I wasn't Colorado. sure what game you were going to say, but Colorado. I know. I could, I could see it on your face. You were like, wait, what could it possibly be? 
Neilan did a fantastic job describing this only moments ago. So I will just get right to why I love it so much. And Neilan touched on this in that it is like the perfect family game. I play this game more with my family than any other game and it's just the barrier to entry is so low you know my sister came and visited me we broke it out at a coffee shop and it's just like it's i'm gonna use the word delightful again but it really is it's just like so simple and sweet and delightful it's always a a good time i'm i've never gotten sick of it and it's just nice to have something that you know your family's gonna like because usually they're like oh what are you gonna make us play tonight you know what i mean so (laughs) (laughs) it's great that's Colorado my 22nd favorite game of all time my 22nd favorite game of all time comes to us from Oink in Japan this is Insider Insider being related to where words we won't argue the origins because I would make many people mad here but but I will say that Insider has a new expansion Insider Black that adds in a sub of the similar elements from where words back into it this is 20 questions with a twist I think that this is marvelous to introduce people to hidden traders, to get people playing something that they would never expect that works so well. I love the stark artwork of Insider. Insider or Where Words, if you have not tried it, you owe it to yourself to give it a look. Really a a masterful game and one that I think I'll be playing for many years to come. That is Insider, my number 22 favorite board game of all time. My 21st favorite game of all time is a double crossover with Kellen who previously mentioned his love of Imperial 2030. Imperial 2030 is a game where the turn order is based on the nations in the game, but you don't necessarily control the nations. Well, you may control a nation, you may control many nations, you may control no nations. The way you gain control of the nations is to put money into them, and the person who has invested the most money in a nation controls the nation. So as Callan mentioned uh, when he brought it up, it is a very uh, cynical game in that way, where you are going in there, you basically bribed the leaders of the nation to give you control to influence their actions, and then when you see a better rate of return somewhere else, you just ditch that nation, you know, strip it of all uh, of as much as you can and then go to the nation that will give you the best rate of return because in the end whoever has the most money wins it's again a unique game in that way it's got a rondelle as well this has been a section of my list full of rondelles and full of unique uh games but uh yeah if you're looking for a aggressive sort of funny in the way that you can sort of like pump and dump a a nation and go to the next one and you know just travel around the board trying to hold sway over these different uh, countries you would do far worse than imperial 2030 i was accused of being perhaps a little too cynical about my glee of the cynicism of imperial 2030 but i I do think it's worth noting that if if you play a game like risk and kind of go uh i don't know how i feel about australia you know and invading north america and like people are dying like do (laughs) not add the layer that is imperial 2030 to this because now it's about money and like literally forcing people to go off and die so it's entirely abstracted in my mind you know there are two versions of this with imperial i believe being a more historical theme and then imperial 2030 kind of being in the far (laughs) future um that is only 10 (laughs) years away um happy new year uh, we don't count 20 we don't count 2020 more what we skipped that year. Okay. <laughs> that was then. Right. Oh, yeah. And this is now. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so that is Imperial 2030, my 21st favorite game of all time. My number 21 game has moved up four spots. It is Decrypto. The first sentence of my notes here says, the party word game that's catching up on code names, which could be a slogan. <laughs> it is moving up my list Closer and closer to Codenames. Codenames, like as Kellen said earlier in the episode, is such a mainstay. A game that I know I will enjoy every time I play it. But Decrypto is, in some ways, the game I want to be playing. It's a little bit more stressful. It's a little bit less accessible. I don't want to play Decrypto all of the time. Because the play here versus something like a Codenames is that you're both trying to set up clues that your team is able to guess, but the other team is not going to be able to steal from you. So there's a very delicate tension, like this knife edge balance of what the appropriate difficulty of the clues you give to your team are, such that they're able to guess them without giving away information to the other team. It's also probably one of the games on my list that I think I've grown fond of in its absence in a year that we couldn't play it because of 
you know, lack of bigger groups. It's a game that you can't play except with four people minimum. So I'm itching to get back to playing more Decrypto, hopefully, in the future. Um, to the publisher of Decrypto, if you put on your box as the tagline for when you are tired of code names, I will buy 10 copies of this game and give them away to people. That is <laughs> <laughs> so funny. That is uh. Decrypto, my number 21. For my 21st favorite game of all times, so I'm going to set it up a little bit with these words. Whoa, a hot summer night fell like a net. I've got to find my baby yet. I need you to soothe my head and turn my blue heart to red. And then the next lyrics go, <laughs> doctor, doctor. <laughs> the doctor is making a lot nice. of appearances this week. And this is, okay, so this is a very old game that I did not learn until recently, and I am so happy that I did. This is Lost Cities. So Daniel slash Longtime Sunshine taught me this uh, recently, and I, Kellen and I have been playing it basically nonstop <laughs> ever since then. It is so much fun. This is a two-player card game played over three rounds in which you are playing to different hops or expeditions. Um, and the object of the game is to not keep your points in the negative because as soon as you play anything into a hop slash expedition, you are in negative 20 points for that expedition. So each player starts the game with a hand of eight cards. And with those cards, you have to decide right away, what do I want to commit to? What do I think I can get enough points for to offset that negative 20 points? To complicate things a little bit, there are handshake cards and that is kind of like doubling down on your bet so you have to play these cards in ascending order starting with the handshake card um, and they go from from two to ten and so you have to decide like man my hand right now doesn't have that many greens but i do have the green handshake card and i have the green 10 so i can probably bet on getting more green cards and then you play that handshake card and then you keep drawing from the deck and you don't realize till the end of the round that kellen started his turn or started the round with the six seven eight nine in green and you just had no idea so it's a really interesting game where you're just waiting as long as possible to commit to a color because you want to make sure you have enough to offset that negative all of the negatives you're getting and you want to wait to reveal a card because as soon as i play that green handshake kellen's gonna be like oh ha 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 i'm gonna hold on to every green card i draw because i don't want her to get them because the other part of the game is that every turn you can either discard your card to the common area or you can play it to an expedition so it's just extremely tight where you're having to make these decisions like oh my gosh do i discard my red six and potentially give kellen you know when i think he's going all in on red so i'm super excited about this game i just i mean like i said we've been playing it nonstop, and i just keep wanting to play it more and it's the doctor so what more can i say i have a little bit of a journal that I keep. And I think in 2020 with Lost Cities, I learned something about myself. And I wrote that I am not as clever as I think I am because of how many times in a row I have lost in Lost Cities to <laughs> Christina. Um, it is a game that I am continually going, ah, I'm going to outsmart her and this is what I'm going to do. And then when we look at the score at the end of the game and I have like <laughs> negative 80, we realize that I have become less clever uh, in my old age than maybe I once was. He plays very aggressively. Uh, that probably won't surprise you, but he kind of puts stuff out there too soon. And then I hold on to all of the cards that he needs. And I never said know. I was a role model. <laughs> I absolutely love this game. I think one of the reasons why it was off my list was the fact that it's two player only. Lost City's Rivals fixes that. It makes it more players. But for some reason, the give and take of a two player game add something to it so it's just, it's just a weird situation and i also i love games like wide up i actually mentioned wide up already where you discard cards to a common pile that other players can take yeah it's because it's yes. so painful it, you have to be so and careful it's, it's so great that you have to do those double or nothing handshake cards before you play any other cards like you have to like yep, commit yep. before you do anything else it's it's a great game 
Uh, this one is on Board Game Arena and very easy if you want to get into. And it does smooth away the biggest hardship with the game, which is scoring. It involves a little bit of math for such a light, light affair. Yeah, the math is hard. That is my 21st favorite board game of all time, Lost Cities. My 21st and the last game in this 40, uh, we just mentioned 40-ish board game episode, is my second favorite hidden trader game of all time, and that is Deception Murder in Hong Kong. Deception Murder in Hong Kong is a amazing game where people have weapons and things left at the scene of the crime, a couple, uh, four of them, or five of them in front of each player. And then one person selects a weapon and a piece of evidence that everyone else is trying to find. They're trying to track you down. And one person is giving vague, vague clues. You know, the scene of the crime was hot. And then everyone at the table is arguing. And Neil and I are arguing about whether a samurai sword or a kitchen knife is hotter. And really, that truly comes down to the arguments where it's like, Mark, do you think a samurai sword or a kitchen knife is hotter? And Mark will come down on one side and Christina will come down on the other side. And it's these absurdist, annoying arguments that just go in a circle where you're trying to present evidence like, well, I think that if it would have been cold, you know, that would have been the kitchen knife like cold butter. And then everyone goes, what? (laughs) And then you have to try to explain your logic to them. I think Deception Murder in Hong Kong is made so much better with some of the expansion roles that allow you to have like two people who are uh, on a team against you. There's something so fun about trying to build this shared logic and then have to realize that you know one person is lying to you. That person's the liar the murderer but that murderer may have an accomplice and the fact that both of them are complicit and trying to sway you in an argument it's sort of like arguing in bad faith you know one of my favorite things is arguing um as you probably know but the idea that you know you could be having this roundtable discussion and one person being against you is one thing but another person that you don't know is also against you and trying to subtly sway you that way What a fantastic hidden trader game. Lowers the barrier on some of the harsh edges of a game like The Resistance. It's a little kinder, a little nicer, a little less, you're the guy. I really, really like this game. I think it's so well made. Yeah, this is a double crossover with me. I spoke about this last week. It is excellent. I think you're absolutely right in that it feels like a little bit like the social deduction game that you can sit in without feeling like under duress all the time, You know, unless you're in the very specific role of, say, the murderer. But like if you're just one of the cop participants, which you can, say, force yourself to be, then you just feel like you're participating in the game without it feeling like the intense pressure of social deduction. That is my 21st favorite board game game of all time deception murder in hong kong this might be the only game on my list that has a colon in it and (laughs) for good reason yeah that's it i think that's it right that is going to do it for this week's edition of the board game barrage podcast that is part three in the bag of our five part series counting down our top 50 games of all time join us next week as we get into the top 20 There's only two more episodes to go in this series. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, as always, to Heart Society for our intro and outro music. What's on your mind, kid? You can check us out at BoardGameBarrage.com. You can email us at BoardGameBarrage at gmail.com or join our Discord at BoardGameBarrage.com slash Discord to discuss all of the games that we've been talking about. Give us your thoughts on what your favorite games of all time and how they compare to our lists. Thank you all for listening and goodbye. And also, if you're listening to this live, just as you go into the weekend, just know that you're doing a great job and everything's going to be okay. Bye. Bye. Well, no one's going to top that. Uh, yeah, and then I think we just go straight to the cat. Oh, and then we and then we say it at the same time, like, like oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And uh, that's why. No, Wait, what are we saying? <laughs> oh, oh, saying that's, 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 that's And that's our number thirty. Okay, Got it. Ready? And that's our at the same time. Oh, oh sorry. We're saying uh, the whole sorry. Sorry. I guess we can do it that way. Okay. Too. Da, da, da. Well, just say the sentence. He'll say the sentence, and then Mark will fix you up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Okay, one, two, three. And that's, and that's our, our number, number 30, 30 game, game of, of all time, time Azul. Azul. Wow, good luck, Mark. Beautiful. <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> to multiple heaps. Not hops, Kelly. Excuse me? <laughs> How dare you, Neil? How and at you. any point before those heaps full, you can choose to take the cards in the... What, Kelly? Is it just heaps? I don't even, it? Are you... Are, is, is, that this, a, is that a real word? What, heaps? Well, I know it's a real word, but is that... Oh, I thought it, this was the South African pronunciation of hop. <laughs> no. I thought you were making a joke about, like, heaps and hops and applesauce. What? What is that? <laughs> what? <laughs> that uh, is not a think. thing. Uh, down by the no. Do you remember down by the banks? Down by the banks of the banks of Banksy. <laughs> I no. can't be right. Down by the banks of the banks of Banksy, where the bullfrogs jump from banks to banks, where the heaps hop soda pops. Hey, Mister Willie, and he went kerplops. Mm, no, <laughs> I don't remember. Any I mean, of that. I said ninety-five percent of those words wrong, but you played it in class. Everybody put their hands out, and you went. Down by the banks of the Banksy Panksy where the bullfrogs oh, jump this. from bank to banky where the heaps hops soda pops. I hey, it was Mr. Willie, and he went ker plops. Maybe it's applesauce. They I didn't make I it in South no Africa. Idea. They, no, we don't. We don't play that game that's in South weird. Africa. So, so that's not where the word heaps came from. <laughs> no, it really, really isn't. The reason I said heaps, I, I don't know how much of this is going to make it, in, but the reason I said heaps is because I always had the idea that heaps is the word that Kellen was going for when he invented hops. Oh. No, no, no. No invention. <laughs> anyway. I realized I think it's down by the banks of the hanky panky. It is. I just but, is it? It is. What, Mark is but doing research on Why this? would they teach children that? Isn't that inappropriate? It's down by the banks of the hankity panky. Hankity panky. Hey, hey. Is that sensual or sexual? <laughs> I think it's just sexual. Yeah. Well, I think this is the most times that the podcast has said the word sexual <laughs> in existence. So we should um, Also, we looked up the definition of both heap and hop, and heap definitely makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, we invented hop. Well, yeah, we definitely say hop and should say hop and neilan's betraying well us. the, the, the yeah, thing that you. is funny about it though is that i just started saying hops because i just trusted kellen was make, saying a word that made sense <laughs> so every time i would describe the game I, to people i would okay. say you play cards into these hops and no one neilan. questioned it neilan <laughs> yeah <stop. laughs> neilan do you trust me not really anymore <laughs> oh my <laughs> Bad case of loving you. I was like, there's a song, a popular song that says Taj Mahal on the <laughs> I have no idea 